Welcome to the macro trading floor. This is Alf speaking. And this is Andreas Stinnel speaking. This is the most actionable macro podcast out there, as you know by now. And uh, we aim at always delivering actionable content by the end of the day. But before we get to that, Alf, um, let's talk about a huge week in European central bank history. I think you labeled the European Central Bank meeting the biggest meeting in the Christine Lagarde era. What do you mean by that? First of all, I should say it's huge and the Mexicans are going to pay for it. No, just <laughs> kidding. Uh, when you said huge, I needed to make the joke. Um, now, um, Lagarde. So, uh, Andreas, I'm, I'm utterly impressed because for the first time in a while, I actually understood what she wants to come up um, what, what's the main message behind her press conference? And basically the main message is, I'm freaking out about core inflation. I see it in my projections at over 4%, that's double the ECB mandate. In a year from today, despite me assuming that we are gonna at least hike what the markets are pricing in, which before the conference was 3%. And then she went on and said, that's by the way, not nearly enough compared to what we plan to hike, because we're going to do 50 basis points, not only now, but we're going to do it probably in February, probably in March. And by the way, if I expect core inflation at 4% a year from now, and I'm a central banker, Andreas, the least I can do to be credible is to hike rates, nominal rates, at least to the same level where inflation is. That would mean a terminal rate at 4%, which is 100 basis point above what the markets were pricing before the meeting which is like, oh my God, it's a tectonic shift. On top of that, she announces quantitative tightening. You need anything else? She's like 15 million a month. Yeah, I know it's not much, but actually we're going to do 30 billion in Q2, spoiler. And on top of it, banks are going to repay TLT euros. So excess liquidity will be coming down anyway. And this piles up on that. So then I'm wondering, they asked her about Italy and she's like, yeah, but it's not really my problem. And the economy is strong, by the way. It's very strong. Labor market is strong. It sounds like Powell four months ago, and I would have never expected Lagarde to be so clear, so hawkish. This was quite a meeting, if you ask me. Yeah. Two lawyers enter a bar and suddenly inflation is 10%, right? <laughs> I think that's uh, the way to put it. But I, I, I agree um, in the sense that this was um, the biggest hint of a central bank lifetime, or at least in her central bank lifetime, right? Um, since she's very vocal now that they need to do something. And um, as you described during the early summer, uh, as soon as in particular core inflation spirals out of control relative to the target, you go from a linear um, reaction function to something that shapes like this, right? Um, so... You're absolutely spot on in that sense. The question is obviously whether that forecast they now base this projection on is right. I have my doubts about that because as soon as they turn this um, scared of inflation, it's usually a signal to turn, <laughs> to turn the other way yourself, right? But in any case, uh, I think you're absolutely right that the market needs to take this as a signal. They need to price in more hikes in the front end. Um, there's no way about it. I mean, it's very simple. She's going to stop you out if you don't. I mean, if you try and be long the front end at these levels and she just says it's, we're going to hike 50 basis points in February and in March, you are kind of forced to price in a higher terminal rate if you're a short-term trader. You have to. Uh, short-term interest rate trader, a steer trader. You have to price it in. There is no alternative. Now, um, data will obviously dictate where the, Federal, uh, where the ECB and the Federal Reserve actually will bring rates at the end of the day because she says core inflation is going to be 4% by next year, end of next year, and actually your work shows that uh, she must be high or smoking some pretty serious <laughs> weed because that's not going to be the case. So tell me a bit, what do you see for, uh, for inflation in Europe? Well, um, I think you showed this as well. Uh, there is a tendency for core inflation on the other side of the pond to lead uh, inflation in Europe, and that holds both for UK and Eurozone inflation. Uh, and I think the average lead is in between five and seven months, um, if you look at it in historical cycles. Uh, so essentially that means that we should expect a peak in European core inflation in probably five months from now, four or five. Um, and therefore, 
my take is basically that you should expect them to sound hawkish at least through Q1 as a consequence of that pattern, right? When it comes to the second half of next year, I feel more and more confident saying that every central bank more or less will be wrong-footed in the other direction. Uh, so inflation will abate quicker than priced in. Um, and the reason is mainly uh, that you see material signs of disinflation, if not outright deflation, in those parts of the economy that move the fastest, right? Um, so as soon as you see an economy cooling off, you see it very quickly in freight rates, you see it very quickly in commodities, um, and you see it very quickly uh, in the price of goods overall speaking. Uh, and you actually even see it in parts of core services now. Uh, so in the US, you even have early hints of labor markets cooling off and wage growth cooling off from a momentum perspective. And if you use some of the forward-looking indicators in the US for wage growth, I'm comfortable saying that in six months from now, the, uh, the wage growth pace is lower than now. So ultimately, I think they will be proven wrong in this inflation um, forecast. But I mean, it doesn't really matter. We're traders, right, Alpha? At least we um, need to look at what's exactly in front of us, first of all. I am now Lagarde and Powell. And I'm driving a car, but I'm looking there. Yeah. For people that are listening on a podcast, I'm looking in the rear view mirror. And that's them. But ultimately, like my mentor used to say, I don't give a shit, Alf, what the Fed should do, in your opinion. It's what they will do. And the same goes for the European Central Bank. And if we are right, Andreas, on European core inflation lagging because of rigidities, because fiscal stimulus was lower and it started later, it was more yeah. spread out over time in Europe than it was in the U.S., if we are right on this theory that so far held well, the data will actually empower the European Central Bank to follow through on their promises and even probably be even more hawkish than that for uh, the next three to four months as a base case scenario, which means that effectively short term, I, I don't know how Italy is going to cope with that. I think the bond markets in Europe have absolutely to reprice pretty aggressively. And you have this weird thing where front-end rates have to go 100 basis points higher, and then that pushes the euro higher at the beginning, right? Because real rates move higher compared to what's happening everywhere, everywhere yeah. else in the world at that moment. But then it also means that BTPs are under uh, attack, uh, Italian government bonds, and that weakens the euro because, hey, fragmentation risks, etc. It's going to be extremely interesting, but what is most interesting to me is that somewhere early next year, I'm going to sit in Europe and I could buy this 30-year German government bonds or Dutch government bonds or some AAA stuff, probably yielding 3%. And I'm really looking forward to that, my friend. Yeah. But I'm going to have to be patient. I'll, I actually have to be short in the meantime. Yeah. And at the same time, I'm looking forward to short the euro versus the US dollar with an arm and a leg again in the Q1, but um, not for now. Um, I also wanted to briefly touch upon the um, Bank of England, um, because in contrast to the European Central Bank, they almost sound like uh, Jim Carrey in I, Myself, and Irene when they hike interest rates, right? They, they, they tell you that they need to hike interest rates, but, oh, they don't like it, and it's a recession, and, oh, we're sorry. And, I mean, they, they really try to sort of cater for their own credibility in the midst of a crisis, right? Um, <clears throat> So at, at least from a rhetorical perspective, it's a very different story. Uh, but I actually think that they will follow the same path as the European Central Bank to a large extent. Uh, but one thing I noted is that two members basically refrained from accepting this 50 basis point hike. Um, and a bit of, um, now I'm donning my uh, tinfoil hat, but um, when you look at central bank incentives um, and you look at the two members, that voted against the 50 basis point hike. Um, Silvana Tenreiro, uh, one of the members voting against it, uh, she was brought forward as a candidate when Andrew Bailey got the job. Mm. Um, and I think this is an obvious chance for her to position herself as the one who did not create the recession because she wants the job after Bailey. Uh, so it's not necessarily something you need to take as a signal that the majority of the board is moving in a direction. I don't think so. She's just trying to play her own cards, so to speak. Central Bank telenovela by Mr. Steno Larsen. <laughs> Gossip in central banking world. No, yes. but it's a, ser it's a serious remark, and I actually uh, agree with you on that point. 
Um, also, interestingly, is that all jurisdictions where the housing market is exposed to either a lot of leverage or some structure of the mortgage market, which is very, very prone to um, and sensible to interest rates, in those jurisdictions, central bankers, at least a portion of the voting members of the central bankers, are showing some distress already, Andreas. Today, Canadian month-on-month um, sales, home sales, actually dropped the biggest amount since 1968, or a number like that. And Canada is, is a pretty high candidate when it comes to real estate um, animal spirits, let's say, that are now being taken away very, very rapidly from the market. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at the bottom five, <laughs> when it comes to the exposure to the mix of high private debt and um, floating interest rates, then you have the UK, um, Canada and Sweden as three of the main candidates. Sweden is probably the worst. Um, in or if you look at the numbers, Poland is probably the worst, but the government, Poland, the Polish government basically cancelled mortgage payments to a large extent for next year, uh, which means that instead of shorting the real estate market, you should short the banks. <laughs> so, I mean, you obviously sent the bill somewhere, right? Um, but I, I agree with you in the UK. I, I did a study um, a couple of weeks ago, a global real estate study, and um, I think the average uh, fixing of a UK mortgage is in between two and two and a half years. So yeah. it rapidly feeds through to, um, to mortgage owners. Andreas, we're getting very excited about all this macro stuff. We live and breathe this thing, right? I mean, there's so much going on all over the world. We have a guest that I think is round about perfect to cover global macro, and I'm very happy to bring him in, shall we? Yeah, we let's do it. And I think we need to disclaim he's older than the two of us in combination. <laughs> That says a lot. <laughs> That's a very fair point, yes. Let's bring him in. It is now our great pleasure to introduce the guest of the week at the macro trading floor, a true legend. And uh, we've been wanting him on this show for quite a while, so we are very thankful that he's finally here. Um, Mr. Felix Sulauf, a warm welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Felix, uh, let's start with a broad question, uh, which basically will be, as we stand today, 13th of December 2022, how do you see macro conditions developing and let's start from the us when it comes to growth and inflation ahead well first of all let me say i think the world today is very different from the world uh, two three years ago and 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 10 years ago and most analysts and investors i speak to do not understand that and i give you an example if you look at the world map and you paint in blue all the countries that have more trade with the US than with China. And in red, all the countries that have more trade with China than with the US. 20 years ago, the world map was blue. You had um, China in red and a few uh, small spots in Asia, and that was it. If you look at the map today, it's North America that is blue, Middle America, Mexico, so NAFTA basically, Great Britain, uh, two or three European economies, not even Germany, and the rest of the world, South America, uh, Africa, Asia is all red. And, and the guys in Washington still look at the world the way they looked at the world in the old days, 10 or 20 years ago. And I think this is completely wrong. I think the US has lost a lot of influence. Uh, more and more countries are turning away from them because they feel that they are not doing the right thing. And, uh, and, and I think this is important. And, uh, you know, the, the war in the Ukraine is just one thing and I don't want to go into it. But when you see that at the recent Arab conference, the keynote speaker always was the U.S. president. And this time it was uh, the Chinese president Xi. Uh, it tells you that something big is changing in the world. And this has important implications for the years to come, not for the next three months, but for the next 10 years to come. 
And I think that is a very important message to investors. So th that's the first observation I have uh, that differs probably from, from many. Um, then when you look at uh, the business cycle and the financial market cycle, uh, the cycles are a little bit out of kilter. There are leads and lags. Um, China is not just in a business cycle downturn, but has really entered a structural crisis that will last many years, similar to what happened in Japan in the early, from the early 90s on. Uh, to sort out the mess and to restructure the corporate sector, it took Japan 20 years. And believe me, the excesses in China are much bigger than they were in Japan. So this is a major restraining factor, not just for China, but for the world, because China used to be the locomotive for the world in the last uh, 20 years. So I think this is very different. Then you have the U.S. situation where the U.S., due to the pandemic and the lockdown and all that nonsense that went with it, they created dramatic fiscal stimulus like never seen before. And they cre created so strong demand at the time when we had supply disruptions due to the lockdown situation. And the result was that to bring demand and supply in balance, prices had to go up. So that created the inflation, the wave of inflation, particularly because the monetary framework over the last um, uh, 10, 12 years has been inflated and is too large anyway for the real economy. So it was easy for inflation to go up. And in 2022, and, and I've, I think you have the same thing in other Western economies to a, to a lower degree. Uh, you have it uh, also to some degree in the UK and to a smaller degree in, uh, in the European Union. Um, I think in 2022, the central banks um, uh, woke up someday and understood that this inflation is going higher than they expected. They were shocked. And the reaction was also shocking. We had the fastest and steepest rise of Fed funds rate in the US ever. Uh, since World War II. So we had a major restraining force applied to the real economy. And uh, because the fiscal stimulus is still holding up to some degree, uh, I think it's, it's, it's coming toward the end of it. Uh, the economy performed much better than uh, most people thought. And, and, it, and it also has to do with demographics where uh, there is a shortage uh, of labor and where we had early retirements uh, in, in the pandemic situation and therefore the shortage that is natural by demographics was really accentuated. So we have a lot of different unique things coming together at the same time. And, and I think we are coming towards the end of the tightening process. Um, because the world economy is cooling off and uh, China is in a deep recession, in my view. Um, you, you know, you, you have to take those published numbers a little bit uh, by a grain of salt. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a severe recession. It is as severe as in 2008 or even worse. That's the Chinese situation. And of course, the lockdowns, the COVID lockdowns were not lockdowns because of the virus. In my view, there were lockdowns to tell the world and to tell the Chinese people, we have to care about the health of our people. But in reality, we don't want to show how weak our economy is and the lockdowns is a good excuse, you see. So I think that was a camouflage, sort of. And uh, Europe uh, messed up uh, because uh, particularly uh, Germany, but it's not alone, because it has strategically all the decisions it made over the last 20 years were basically wrong. Uh, it's, it's just 
horrible. I mean, the political leadership in Europe is just not worth a cent, you know. Uh, 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 Germany has outsourced energy production to Russia and uh, defense to the U.S. and uh, final demand to China and to the U.S. and um, uh, monetary policy to Brussels or to the EU, to the ECB and, and things like that. It's just a mess. They are not um, uh, deciding about their own destiny. You know, it's, it's awful. And so we have an energy crisis, and at the same time they turned off nuclear power um, uh, when a problem was building up. They turned it off before they had the alternatives ready. So th those are ideologists uh, and very dogmatic ideologists uh, in power, and, um, and, and therefore we are now in a messy situation. We are in a very weak economy and the, economies, the economic weakness will deepen in Europe uh, until they realize what they have created. And this winter, we may get through this winter without very much disruption, but the next winter will be worse, in my view, because we, won't, we, we don't have a solution uh, to the problem. And, and so that's the situation we are in. And the weakness is now beginning to come to the surface. The wave of bankruptcies is beginning to rise. Uh, the uh, layoff, uh, layoffs that we see from the corporate sector are beginning to come to the surface. So it's all coming to the table. And uh, at some point in the first half of next year, 2023, I think we will see the central bank to swing around and go from tightening to easing. But where a big debate is going on is whether the current tightening is harsh or soft. You know, those who believe in real interest rates as a policy tool believe this is not enough to kill inflation and to slow the economy well enough. Um, those who believe in, th 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 those are the ones believing in price and Jay Powell is in that camp. If you believe in the quantity of money, then the story is very different. You have uh, dramatic slumps in the monetary aggregates. And, and I just, uh, I look at uh, something uh, not many look at, which is uh, world dollar liquidity, which is basically the monetar U.S. monetary base plus uh, treasuries held by foreign central banks. And uh, that has declined now by 12% year over year. That is the most dramatic decline that I have seen in my lifetime. And I'm not a young chap. So uh, I, I think this is very rigid what's going on. And in every press conference, uh, when there is Q&A or the remarks, Jay Powell always neglects the quantity of money and always points out that the price of money is very important. So I think they are probably creating a policy, making a policy mistake. So I think tomorrow will be the last hike uh, for the cycle, most likely. And uh, sometimes um, in the first half or so toward the middle of maybe in Q2, we will even have a cut. They will stop uh, tapering at some point. Uh, then they will uh, really ease and eventually they will cut rates. So I think we go, we just turn around in the cycle. And the Europeans, they have never really tightened dramatically. They have hiked interest rates, but they have not tightened because they cannot. Because if they tighten, the whole house of cards is coming crumbling down. And, uh, and that's the situation we are in. Um, the Chinese, I'm not sure whether they are reading the tea leaves right, but I think the Chinese understand that they are in, a, in the early stage of a long balance sheet recession, that they um, uh, need to, to go through a major restructuring, uh, recapitalization recapital, of the banking industry, etc., etc. That will take years. I think they will provide support, but not the stimulus that you see. You know, whenever Chinese credit growth went up 
the world was jumping up and down and saying, oh, they are stimulating like mad. They didn't realize that the Chinese corporate sector was forced by the government to pay back their dollar denominated loans of about 25% of the total. That was a, um, an order and replacing it by renminbi loans and therefore the renminbi loans that show up in the statistics but the dollar denominated loans do not you know it looked like we have a great uh, loan growth and therefore the economy will do well so we have to be very careful with numbers when we look at them numbers are important but you have to read and look behind the numbers so yeah, I think 23 um, uh, looks like um, we are going to end uh, this uh, cyclical correction in the stock market. Uh, it looks like uh, the high in bond yields is already in. Or we may, you know, there are some games being played by the Treasury because of the debt ceiling uh, being closed. They are drawing down uh, the general account at the Fed. And that injects liquidity and it really um, uh, helps the treasury market because there is less supply than it should be. And, uh, and therefore it could be that we have seen the high of treasury bond yields a little bit too early or we may bounce back into early, uh, let's say in, into the first quarter. Uh, near the previous high that we had at 4.30 or what it was for 10-year treasuries. That, that is possible. If it does, I think 10s and 30s are a great um, a trade for the um, ensuing uh, six to nine months uh, period thereafter. And if that is true, then I think we are coming closer to the stock market bottom. Uh, we have the valuation correction is behind us. Uh, what's still ahead of us is the problems with earnings. My hunch is that um, uh, corporate earnings uh, for the S&P 500 could easily decline 20-25% in 23, and that's not priced in yet. So uh, right now, many people think because the Fed will only hike 50 basis points and CPI is coming down slowly, that they think, well, the low is in inequities. I'm not so sure. I think we have another down leg due to the earnings problems ahead. And uh, I cannot tell you exactly when it's over, but I would think that uh, sometimes in the first quarter we will see uh, another decline early next year, another decline in the stock market. And uh, whenever that ends, uh, that will be the end of uh, the cyclical correction. And then with the reliquification of the system that I described before, that I see from spring on or so, uh, it is likely that we have another cyclical bull run in the stock market. And I'm particularly um, uh, bullish for the commodity sector because I think the excess liquidity central banks will create and the banking system then will begin to create will flow into those assets that are scarce, uh, where scarcities are. And I think uh, the, the commodity uh, situation is where the scarcest assets are uh, because of underinvestment for many years and because of the world I described before, where large producers of some metals and some uh, energy products, um, uh, crude oil, etc., are on the in the other block in the autocratic block against the democratic block and if price goes up it doesn't mean that supply will increase you know in a free market environment when price goes up supply eventually increases but if you have an intensifying conflict between the two superpowers and their allies then it may very well be that as prices go up, supply will go down, not up. And this is just another world. And, uh, and we have to get familiarized with, with this new world. So um, if the conflicts intensify there, and particularly 
if the Western world and whoever it is would do something against Iran, uh, I would think that uh, we have to be prepared for the closing of the Straits of Hormuz and something crazy like that. And, and then all the bets are off, of course. Uh, so I think it will be a very wild and volatile world in the next few years, very good for macro traders and very, very difficult for passive investors who just buy and sit. You know, they can get very disappointed uh, uh, in the next two, 10 years or so. I guess I love that message being a macro guy, just like you, Felix. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to get your take um, on a survey I saw just earlier this week. I think around 42% of all surveyed economists expect a recession within the next year or year and a half. Um, this is by far the clearest signal ever in the um, Bloomberg Economist survey uh, for future growth. We've never seen such a uniform signal from economists expecting a recession ahead. So first of all, is this the most pre-announced recession ever, if we get a recession next year? And what does that make you think in terms of asset allocation, if everyone already agrees on a recession? Well, the, the question is, are the same guys uh, positioned for a recession or not? <laughs> And, uh, and that's the more important uh, question because, uh, you know, economists do not make investment decisions. Economists uh, influence investment decisions, but they do not make them. Uh, the, the money managers decide. Of course, I see that uh, uh, quite some cash has been raised uh, and uh, uh, investors have become more defensive in their portfolios. Um, uh, and uh, and aggressive money is even short and therefore this uh, current recovery will carry on uh, a little bit further. I'm not talking the next few days, I'm talking uh, uh, several more weeks, uh, uh, probably into January or, or whatever. Uh, and, you know, there was a consensus in the hedge fund community uh, a while ago that was actually all of a sudden um, where I was, in my view, my view was first quarter will be the low and late in the first quarter. And I derived that from um, uh, the macro picture plus trading cycles. Uh, there is a 40-week trading cycle, an 80-week trading cycle, 160-week trading cycle. They all come together for an important low in March. So I thought uh, that is ideal, that fits my fundamental understanding of the picture, but I could be wrong. And when there is a strong consensus, you always have to question what, uh, what could go wrong. Either you do not get the decline in the stock market, you get the rally that continues and turns everybody very bullish and sucks them in and the rally goes higher. And uh, I, recall, I recall the bear market rally of 1973. Uh, I was a young chap, younger than you are right now, and, uh, and I was uh, heavily leveraged and short the market, and I was trading through that uh, uh, counter trend move. And it went higher and for longer than I had expected and many others had expected, but eventually, the stock market halved uh, because of a serious recession. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying the stock market will have, but I think eventually we'll have another decline. Uh, I cannot tell you with a high um, accuracy when exactly that will be. I have to go along the wall like everybody else. But you develop you 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 do your analysis you develop an investment thesis you invest accordingly and then you manage your risks and your positions and and that's what what's happening in the real world making a forecast out of the blue uh, five years out that's easy uh, but that doesn't help everybody and, and nobody you know so so i i think uh, we have to prepare for some surprises uh, early in the year that maybe the decline that I had been expecting before may not come, uh, may come but later and from a somewhat higher level. You know, I said um, I, I turned constructive for a counter trend recovery 
in uh, early October, late September, early October, and I said, and, and we were trading down at 3600 S&P or something like that, and I said, we could go up to 4200. And, uh, and I got a lot of emails and uh, questions from my subscriber base, <laughs> whether I was not too bullish. <laughs> and, you know, as we approach the 4200, I, I guess I will get a lot of questions, are you not too bearish? And actually, usually the echo that I get is usually quite telling because it reflects a general sentiment out there. And uh, you can look at surveys and at sentiment indicators and it's not, uh, it's not one-sided. It's, I would call it neutral right now. It's surprising how high the put-call ratios are at the present time. It doesn't fit it doesn't fit the thesis of this being a temporary high. Actually, the put call ratio right now is rather more where it usually is at the bottom, at the medium term bottom. Now, this could be because a lot of the aggressive money is using some of the profits they made to buy insurance for next year for their portfolios. So it may be distorted. But, uh, but still, it doesn't feel like this is the end of the recovery yet. It will most likely go further and the bears will have to suffer a little bit longer and more. And the bulls will have uh, a lot more fun in the, car in the next few weeks. But eventually, I think we'll see another medium term down leg. And, and I, I expect the down leg to go lower than we have been. My call, uh, I turned bearish uh, a good year ago, and my call was about a 30% decline, which would have turned into the low 3,000, 3,200 or so on the, on the S&P. And uh, of course, we came close, but the earnings side was missing. The earnings are still very high up. And the earnings are holding up, and, and this is a, really a new phenomenon because the corporate sector in many countries, not in Germany, but in many of the other countries I looked up, uh, profit margins have not only held up, they went even higher. So the whole inflation period that we had and in the media was used by the corporate sector to raise prices uh, very clearly. And if final demand weakens at some point next year, as I expect, and inventories are on the high side right now relative to sales, and then we will see price cuts on, on products. And as we see price cuts, it means that it's also a cut on profit margins, and then earnings will surprise on the downside. This episode is brought to you by Curve. Curve is a payments card company that empowers customers to control, maintain, and direct total control into their finances. By using Curve and adding your other cards to Curve's wallet, you unlock new value like cash flow management, self-driving money, and the ability to stack rewards. Guys, basically think of Curve like one unique credit card that helps you maximize your rewards. Rather than add another card to your wallet, Curve instead combines all your cards into one. It effectively helps you maximize your rewards. You also earn a 1% cashback on everything that you buy between now and the next six months. It is also useful to get on top of your cash flows by consolidating multiple credit cards into one single place. You are eligible to receive $20 in Curve Cash to your Curve account within 14 days of you downloading the Curve app through the referral link in the description list of the podcast and making your first transaction. So if you want to get your $20 in cash back, the referral link is in the description below the video. Felix, um, Let's try to piece all of this together. It's always a pleasure to listen to your uh, macro overview. But you talked about several asset classes and several geographies here. And you also said, you know, macro strategists and investors have a, a thesis and then they develop a portfolio accordingly and then they manage the risk around. So I'm wondering if you piece all of this together, what's the most mispriced asset or investment opportunity you see out there for the next six to 12 months? 
if I'm right in my analysis, then I think um, the long bonds will have a, um, a, a big run. You cannot say it's very mispriced because relative to inflation, it's really not mis it's mispriced on the wrong side. Uh, but, you know, I could see that inflation, inflation has gone higher than everybody thought. And I think inflation could also surprise on the downside. That's against the consensus. The consensus says we can come down maybe 4%. Uh, a month or two ago, they were 4 or 5%. Now maybe 3 4% or something like that. You know, you have commodity prices declining due to the economic situation. Uh, you have um, uh, China that will probably send a whiff of deflation uh, overseas and our import prices uh, are declining. You have the base effect uh, um, uh, entering the picture. And if you take all that together, you know, I could see that CPI all of a sudden surprises on the downside. That would be another shock for central banks and particularly and I think that's particularly true for the US. Uh, and, and if that's the case, let's say inflation goes to 1% CPI in the US, then the 10 and the 30 year bond at current prices is very attractive. I'm not saying for five years, I'm saying for six to nine months. So, so in that sense, I think that is, uh, that is a favor trade uh, of mine. Um, and if that is right, then at some point with a delay, uh, the growth stocks will kick in. You know, when you had a, a big bubble like we have seen in the NASDAQ and the FANGs, um, that bubble usually deflates in the pattern of Big down, sharp down first, big sharp bounce up, and then erosion for some years. And I think the low that we will approach in 23 for that segment will be that first low. Sharp down, low, sharp bounce, and the first leg up in the stock market, they will perform fantastically. But after that, they will die because after that, the commodity complex will rise further and the back end of the cycle, the energy stocks, the metal stocks, uh, everything uh, related to agriculture, everything related to precious metals, and that part will take over and carry on together with commodities. And then the growth stocks just die. And uh, that's why I think there, there could be a good trade but not an investment. So you can uh, engage in some dancing, but not marrying them. <laughs> That's a good way of, uh, of framing it, Felix. And um, what you described feels a little bit um, resemblant of what we saw just after the dot-com bubble, right? Um, also this sharp leg lower, and then we sort of had a uh, retracement after a bounce uh, that took quite some months to, to, uh, to unfold, right? Felix, if we... Boil it all down, you like the long bond as the potential best risk reward trade for a very weak economy into the early parts of 2023. But we always ask this question to our guests, what could wrong foot your view into 2023? What is the risk scenario to your view that you fear the most? Well, f first of all, that is a trade that I described, which is counter to my longer term conviction into 25. Okay, so this is a counter trend move and counter trend moves are often short and sharp. Uh, uh, and short and sharp as an aggressive, uh, I'm not uh, as aggressive as I used to, but as an aggressive investor that I used to be in the past, I like short and sharp. <laughs> That's where your uh, your returns your returns come from. Um, what could go wrong? Uh, first of all, I think there is a high risk. Um, it, this is not the forecast. This is just the fear I have that uh, the war in Ukraine could broaden into a world war. 
That's my biggest fear. We have the weakest crop of political leaders around in the West. I have never seen so weak leaders. We have not one single diplomat and uh, power broker of the format of Henry Kissinger who could uh, straighten this thing out. And it would be easy to straighten out. The, the pieces of the puzzle are clear. There should never have been a war. It was a provocation what happened by the US and the Russian had no choice. They have worn so often where the red line is and once the red line was crossed again and again they had to act. And they are the aggressor, of course. Uh, that should have been easy to solve on the diplomatic stage. But we simply do not have the staff to do that and not the leaders to do that. And Russia feels uh, being cheated. Last week there was an interview in Die Zeit, a, a German newspaper with Angela Merkel. Um, I uh, read that interview. In that interview Merkel says, well, the Minsk agreement was basically to give time to Ukraine that they could prepare their defense against Russia. So it was never meant to be a step towards a peaceful solution, but it was meant to give them time for a war, <laughs> fighting a war. Uh, you know, and then we had in, in March, April, we had the discussion between Putin and Zelensky and they had an agreement ready to sign and Zelensky would have signed it to save his people. Uh, and then uh, Joe Biden and Boris Johnson both told him, you may not sign. We want you to fight on. So, you know, when you see the cost of lives, the uh, Ursula von der Leyen recently um, uh, made a mistake by uh, disclosing the number uh, they have from their secret services. So it's 100,000 deaths. Uh, uh, troops uh, uh, on the Ukrainian side and usually the ratio is one to four to wounded and that means that um, half a million uh, are uh, gone from the Ukrainian army which uh, was supposed to be about one million uh, so it's getting it, it's getting very costly in terms of life and it's cruel uh, of course, you also have the victims on the Russian side. Uh, the, of, there are no official numbers, but the numbers vary between uh, 20, 30,000 on the low side and 90,000 on the high side. And probably 50, 60,000 is probably a realistic number. Uh, and they are filling up uh, their troops again. And I'm, I'm fearful that... Um, the US not reading the global situation correctly is pulling the Europeans into a war the Europeans do not want. You know, we are already, the Europeans are already engaged with uh, weapons and ammunition and money and sanctioning the other side. That's deeply involved in a war. What's not there yet is troops, as they say, officially. Although the Russians tell us that uh, there are NATO troops or soldiers, paid soldiers from NATO troops fighting in a Ukrainian um, um, uh, suit. And, uh, and I do not know, I cannot verify that, but I think this is very dangerous. It could really spread out to become a third world war. And, and I fear that uh, a lot. That could go wrong. Felix, the only thing I can say at this point of the interview is thank you for um, giving us 35 minutes of your time. But also, I would like people to know, in case they don't know you, which I don't know how this is possible, but in case they don't, and they liked what you had to say and the, the presentation you did in these 35 minutes, where can they find more about you and what you do? Um, you know, there is uh, my homepage is the easiest way to have access, which is www.felixzulauf.com. Felix Zulauf, one word. 
and there you find us and uh, we publish uh, regularly about every two weeks about macro issues from geopolitics to politics the business cycle interest rates currencies equities equity sectors and commodities and uh, and uh, i have been doing this all my life i used to be a money manager from uh, my early 20s onwards uh, until about uh, 10 years ago when i sold the business uh, I uh, turned uh, my share of the company that I had founded into my family office. So I only run proprietary money and less aggressive than I used to do. But the world is so interesting from an analytical point of view that uh, I can't stop loving it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, Felix, you make it sound like you only run a few hundred euros. I think it's a bit more than that. Right? But <laughs> in any case, Mr. Felix Sulov, it was a great pleasure to host you at the Macro Trading Floor. And uh, we are very honored that you took your time to, to be our guest of the week. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andreas and Alfonso. It's been a great pleasure to be with thank you. Felix. Thank you very much. Back on the post segment section of the macro trading floor on uh, this week, the week of the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, uh, pff, whatever central bank, we had the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Felix Zulauf, considered actually a legendary macro investor, now running his family offices and consultancy business. And um, Mr. Felix uh, thinks that this 10 to 30 year US bond yields are going to be much lower at the mid of the end of next year than they are today. He even expects inflation cyclically to drop to one, one and a half percent. He wouldn't be surprised to see that. And therefore, the Fed is going to roll over at some point and buying these treasuries now is going to look pretty good six to 12 months ahead. How to implement that? I think it's very simple. A bunch of ETFs in the US do that. TLT, one of the most famous, but there are many of those, Andreas. I need yeah. to ask you, what do you make of buying uh, 30 year treasuries on a, say, six months horizon? It's not that I dislike it, um, but I'm not particularly fond of the risk reward of doing so given today's levels. Um, not least, um, as we discussed in the intro section, due to the fact that you have other jurisdictions across the globe working against you in that trade to a certain extent, right? Um, you love that trade when you have global central banks in tandem cooling off. Um, but right now you have global central banks pointing in various directions. Um, one could argue that the Fed is not even done hiking, right? Um, so I guess the very simple rule is don't buy TLT until you get the sense that sort of field of the pamphlet of global central banks is close to coordinatedly move in the other direction. Um, but when that said, I, I think Felix, Felix is right that the Fed is one of the leading indicators for the rest of the pack in, in the global central bank space. Um, and I wouldn't be too surprised to see the Fed um, being close to the end of the hiking cycle during Q1, um, which means that we are not too far off a decent entry point. Um, and I also, I even think that he admitted himself that you could get better entry points into the early parts of next year. And I tend to agree with that. Um, also from a, a um, liquidity perspective. So there's a lot of, uh, of moving parts here. And if you look at it on a six to nine month horizon, yes, I think it will perform, but I find better trades out there. Yeah. So I think at this stage, this would be roughly my take. Um, if I need to hold something for six months or a bit longer here, to be honest, I am pretty sure we're going to be walking into a serious global recession anywhere by the end of next quarter. And I'm looking at um, short term uh, instruments like, you know, T-bills or anything that replicates a two year risk free exposure yielding four and a half percent. Andreas, I mean, that, that, honestly, I find that to be a pretty decent tailwind for any book next year to have. First, because it carries pretty decently on your money in the first place. And second, because you're going to get a decent mark to market uh, move as well your way if indeed the Federal Reserve has to roll over um, in a global recession. And I think they will and not uh, maybe 30 percent is priced in, but not more from some work I've done on the macro compass. The long end is obviously more exposed to different dynamics, as you said. Um, I think it's going to look an, an excellent buying opportunity at some point. Um, 
if I would need to keep it for 12 months. There was somebody on Twitter that actually, I don't remember who it is, Macro Curd, I think it is, he's an emerging market specialist, a uh, very good guy for emerging markets macro on Twitter. And he posted out a question like, hey, if you would have to own a trade for 12 months going forward, what would you own? And um, without touching it, you can't touch it. It's just a trade you need to own. And I wrote um, long December 24 euro dollar. It's just basically like saying long two year treasuries. It's uh, something similar, right? So I tend to like that part of the curve for a long term uh, ownership rather than, uh, than TLT from a risk work perspective at this stage. Shall we talk about the Fed, by the way? It's the elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we get to that, let me try and sum up the week in central banking in two memes. And we will, of course, add the memes uh, in the video section on, uh, on YouTube. Um, I think we can sum up the Federal Reserve meeting uh, with the meme, I will hike interest rates until you morons stop trading monkey JPEGs. And I think we can summarize the European Central Bank meeting with the following words, I'm going to hike interest rates until you morons stop using more gas than we have. <laughs> so uh, that's the week in central banking. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we are at the end of the hiking cycle. That's what I'm saying. Uh, we simply need to see convincing signals that energy prices are coming down in Europe. I think that's a key. Uh, and we need to see convincing signals that markets are not spiraling out of control with animal spirits resurfacing as soon as Powell backs off, right? Because he doesn't want that. And he's clear in that. In, in my opinion. Powell, um, Powell, Andreas, basically in the press conference, sounded a bit like, guys, please stop pissing in the wind because yes. it's going to come back to your face. So I'm telling you that I don't like when you loosen up financial conditions. So if you test me out every single time, I'm going to come up and say that I don't like that and I'm going to sound more rockish. So maybe you don't get that. Let me tell you something else. I think the labor market is red hot and how red hot I think it is in my own projection, the summary of economic projections, the Fed said that they expect unemployment rate to move from 3.6 to 4.6%. That's a full percentage point, Andreas. Yes. And there is a rule from a former economist at the, at the Fed, Claudia Sam, I think it's her name. And the Sam rule says that if the three-month moving average of unemployment in the US goes 50 basis points above the last 12 months low, so in this case it would be 4.1% or 4%, if that happens, the U.S. is already in a recession. Now, Powell thinks that unemployment rate is going to go not 50, but 100 basis point above the last 12 months low. Nevertheless, we're not going to have a recession because the labor market is so damn hot, Andreas, that he can get a lot of people unemployed and it's going to be fine at the end of the day. That's how much he thinks the labor market is hot. And that's how much he's going to press on the fucking pedal until... He sees literally people losing their jobs. That's what he told you, I think. Yes, um, but I understand why they they create this forecast mix because it's just so much easier not to forecast a recession. <laughs> yeah, Bank Bank of England forecasted a recession. Uh, was it already at the August meeting? Uh, and I think that's the reason why they sound like a dog that hadn't had any food for days <laughs> every time they step on the scene, right? Um, so they they really struggle. Um, arguing in favor of rate hikes since they forecast a recession, that makes it a lot trickier to defend it, right? So I think that's the reason. I, I mean, implicitly, when you forecast one percentage point higher on employment, you also forecast a recession. You just don't do it on paper. Um, what I wanted to add is that there is a technicality that we need to discuss in terms of the Fed and the link to the U.S. Treasury uh, that may influence the Fed during the first a quarter of next year, um, even if it's a technicality and it's temporary, um, we know that the debt ceiling looms again in the U.S. So we have the we have the crossover date coming up um, during the first part of Q1. So essentially, the U.S. will basically hit the ceiling um, in terms of how much debt they can have outstanding, uh, which means that the U.S. Treasury um, is per se not allowed to hold a lot of excess cash ahead of that particular day because they don't want to incentivize politicians um, negotiating for days, right? Uh, so instead what they typically do is that they bring the level of dollar reserves held at the treasury zone account at the Federal Reserve to a bare minimum ahead of that deadline, typically below 100 billion. Uh, and typically they aim at the level of the treasury general account when the debt ceiling was lifted the last time, which is in this case, 85 billion. 
Um, and that is a bit more than 300 billion below today's level uh, or thereabout, which means that the F U.S. Treasury will allow the rest of the market to receive those U.S. dollars in the meantime. And you could argue that it basically annuls the whole balance sheet contraction of the Federal Reserve during the same period, over the next three months. Um, and from a risk asset perspective, I think Jay Powell is annoyed by this because he knows that, uh, I mean, this is certainly not helping them trying to contain animal spirits when these dollars uh, reach um, private banks. Um, and it may be that they will have to sound hawkish for a bit longer than they want to just because of this technicality. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So, of course, there is um, a relationship between the amount of uh, reserves that uh, private banks have and the amount of risk taking they're willing to take. Uh, I would caution a bit between drawing two lines on a chart and saying it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. There is obviously a macro relationship to be made between the two. And it's an interesting uh, setup there, Andreas, because Powell doesn't want that, but he, he doesn't have any power to stop that. So <laughs> the, the only, and also, to be honest, the TGA will be replenish to more decent levels once that ceiling is, is raised, but it's a temporary thing to notice, which is very interesting. Yeah, and you could argue that you get sort of a double whammy QT during the spring then. Uh, as soon oh, as yeah. that ceiling is lifted, they will start issuing a lot more than, than usual to build up the uh, level of cash again, uh, which means that they will withdraw liquidity at the same time as the Fed does it. So yeah. um, double whammy by the time that Joe Biden actually signs a new level of the debt ceiling. Okay, Andres, now I need to do something before we close the interview. Um, I think people, uh, are at least, first I want to thank all the bazillion listeners we have every week. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's my Italian accent, Andreas, shirts, I don't know what it is, but thank you very much for listening to the podcast every week. Really appreciate it. Your support in 2022 has been massive for us, really. I think we're getting like probably 50,000 downloads or so per each show by now. It's incredible. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is if you appreciate what Andreas and me do here, actually both of us have a research product that we offer where, um, mine is called the macro compass and you know, I I I we launch product on January 1st. There is a different year for different kind of investors. If you like what we do, this podcast is fun, but I think at least for me, there is plenty more that I can offer on the subscription services. Andreas, your turn to plug in standard research now. Yeah, um, so we, we launch right about the same date. Um, but in contrast to you, we haven't set up the payment systems yet. So yeah, you, will, you will have to wait. Um, and for now, um, I will leave you with a cliffhanger that um, I guess we aim at being the best sort of niche European research house, uh, which means that we will also have a, a very uh, clear focus on what's going on in the energy space in Europe, because I don't think that we are out of the woods yet. Um, so let's leave you <laughs> with, uh, with those commercials uh, for the week. Um, Elf, it was a pleasure again. And uh, I, I think for once, I can promise you that next week, at least from a central bank perspective, will be boring relative to the one that we just had. Uh, yes. But I, I think markets will have a lot to digest. So I actually think that we should expect um, a bit of volatility into Christmas. Listen, Andreas, for the last episode of the, of the year, of the macro trading floor, uh, in the intro and out, actually in the outro section, I'm going to bring some pandoro and panettone, typical Italian Christmas stuff. And we're going to eat it together as we talk about whatever you want to talk about, man. It's going to be the 23rd of December. Give me a break. But we are still going to do the macro trading floor for you guys. One last episode next week. So I guess we can say goodbye, Andreas, now, right? Yeah. And then that means, Elf, that... Um, we have an episode the 25th of December, and then we have an episode for you coming out 1st of January. Oh, God. Oh, God. If, uh, I mean, if anyone of you dares to listen to us 1st of January, yes. um, then I'm glad that I didn't attend the uh, New Year's party that you were at. <laughs> Let me put it like that. <laughs> I think that was all for this week. My name is Andreas Steno. And I'm Alf. Talk to you guys next week. Bye.